Hi, it's Writing Wednesday, November 14th, day 14 of NaNoWriMo, and a fellow NaNoer and YouTuber, Kate of Kate's Novel Idea, tagged me with something called the NaNoWriMo Tag 2012, so today's video is basically going to be me answering a bunch of questions about NaNoWriMo. I first started doing NaNoWriMo in 2003, so nine years ago, and every year since then, except for two years, uh, when I didn't attempt it, I've written 50,000 words during the month of November. Several of my published books have spent part of their life as nano novels, but I've also had as yet unsuccessful nano projects where I, you know, spent November writing something that so far has never seen the light of day. I really don't remember. Online somewhere is all I can tell you. Oh, I am absolutely in it to win it. Getting 50,000 words written is the whole point. Yes, at 21,660 words, I am right on track with my word count. The book is an as-yet-untitled historical novel set mostly here in Newfoundland. Uh, it begins in 1892, the year of the Great Fire of St. John's, and will probably wrap up in 1925, the year that women earned the right to vote, which is uh, an important date for the novel because my main character is quite an ardent suffragist. Actually, there are two main characters. There's Lily, yes, I went with Lily rather than Lucy as a character name, uh, and her daughter Grace. And Lily used to be quite an activist and an idealist in her youth until something happened to shatter her ideals. Since her marriage she's become very conventional and very disapproving of her uh, somewhat more radical daughter Grace. Grace starts poking around in the family history, uncovers some secrets that Lily never meant her to know, and things kind of unfold from there. I'm sure both my mother and my daughter are going to be thrilled that I'm writing a novel that focuses on difficult mother-daughter relationships, but I'm hoping that by setting it over a hundred years in the past I'll keep it from getting too autobiographical. Nothing crazy, but unexpected things do happen, especially when characters I didn't really plan for show up. For example, the man with no nose. My character Grace is volunteering in a hospital with First World War veterans who are very badly disfigured. And uh, this man uh, was really just supposed to be background in a single scene. He's lost one eye, he's lost almost all of his nose, and this one character kind of ended up being more interesting than I thought. I think he's going to come back and be a recurring character. Although if he were to become a major character in the story, this could create a problem with the ever-popular what if your book gets made into a movie question. Now, none of my books have ever come within a million miles of being made into a movie. There's not the slightest danger of it. But I do think about it, and I notice that Hollywood has a huge bias towards people with their noses intact. For example, Game of Thrones. Tyrion loses, I'm pretty sure, his whole nose or most of it in a battle scene. Are they going to remove Peter Dinklage's whole nose? Of course they're not. First of all, I'm pretty sure Peter Dinklage has a clause in his contract that requires his nose remain intact. But also, Hollywood actors tend to be better than average good-looking people, and neither they nor audiences really want to see their faces completely disfigured. I realize that thinking about who would play the noseless man in a movie of my as yet unwritten book is probably getting ahead of myself. I have... Tina, Katrina, Christine, and Karen. I'm sorry, Karen's name doesn't seem to rhyme with the rest. For me, the biggest procrastination problem is the internet. I mean, I'm a full-time mom and a full-time teacher as well as a writer. When I finally do carve out some time for writing, my worst habit is then just wasting time online. So my best anti-procrastination tip is to get away from the internet. I used to always write on my Alpha Smart Neo for first drafts, which of course has no internet access. This year I've been using my playbook with a Bluetooth keyboard. Uh, that works pretty well. If I'm in a place with Wi-Fi, it does have the internet, but it's not so easy to click away from my writing and end up on Facebook or Twitter, which is, you know, what I tend to do. Since I've already revealed in an earlier video that I love writing in coffee shops, I would have to say my favorite snack would be to order a tall, non-fat, no-whip raspberry mocha while I'm writing, and uh, some of those little dark chocolate-covered graham biscuits that they keep temptingly near the cash register. Well, this is where we run into kind of a problem, because I would love to tag the four friends I mentioned earlier, Tina, Katrina, Christine, and Karen, but none of them are on YouTube. And I think this kind of relates to the fact that most of my real-life writer friends are like myself, you know, women of a certain age, and YouTube seems to be mainly a young person's game. In fact, I often look around YouTube and feel like I am the oldest vlogger in the world. Uh, I'm 47. If you can think of anyone who vlogs on YouTube regularly who's older than me, other than Chuck Testa, that uh, taxidermy guy, tell me about it in the comments, because I would love to know. So, you know, that's not going to keep me off YouTube or away from vlogging, uh, but it does keep me from tagging anybody. So, unless one of my real-life writer friends does choose to make a video, which I would love to watch, I think the tag stops here for me.